Welcome to Carl Sandburg College. Sandburg College has a rich history of providing educational and workforce needs to the citizens of West Central Illinois. This video is intended to encourage future generations to carry on the torch of providing like services to the citizens of Western Illinois. Carl Sandburg, the college's namesake, once said that he didn't know where he was going, but he was on his way. Carl Sandburg's most favorite and used quote was that nothing happens unless first a dream. In 1966, 27 people had a dream. They visioned that this area could truly establish a low-cost institution of higher education that would enable local residents to further their education and enhance their chosen profession without being forced to travel hundreds of miles from home. Yes, there were many who told these visionary citizens that what they had was truly a pipe dream. Who were our forefathers? John Lewis, Russ Lynn, Lewis Long, Mabel Butterfield, Paul Platt, Bob Peck, just to name a few. They met on September 5th of 1965 on the second floor of the Knox County Courthouse. John Lewis, of whom our gym is named, was elected chairman and his first task was to persuade reps of the Rova School District not to withdraw. Thank goodness he was successful. In the beginning, it was called the Knox Warren Junior College. In May of 1966, the committee comprised of friends and neighbors worked within the framework of House Bill 1710. The proposed community college would serve specifically the residents of Knox and Warren counties, included cities like Abington, Yates City, Knoxville, Williamsfield, Gelsberg, and the Valley School District, and in Warren County, Monmouth, Yorkwood, and Warren. The institution sought in their proposal to offer vocational and technical educational training programs two-year college parallel programs, terminal educational programs for grades 13 and 14, adult education programs, and occupational retraining programs. At that time, the problem was defined in this manner. There was a definite need to provide expanded and educational opportunity for more of our children. In 1900, for instance, roughly only 4% of high school grads went to college. By 1950, 15% of the group were enrolled in higher education. In 1966, 40% of high school grads were on their way to college, and by 1970, more than half of the high school grads would go on to some form of higher education. Dr. Glenny, the chairman of the Illinois Board of Higher Education, stated that within the next 10 years, more than half of all freshmen and sophomores in Illinois would be expected to be enrolled in the state's mushrooming public junior colleges. Recently, the University of Illinois had turned away 7,500 applications. Turndowns were proportionally as high at Western Illinois University, Knox, and Monmouth Colleges. Well, I think when I first came, we had even more non-traditional students. It, at least it seemed that way. Uh, I think there were so many students out there who were just waiting for a chance for an education. When I graduated from high school in 65, Sandberg didn't, didn't exist, and I went up to Blackhawk. So I had come from that environment, and I was so excited to think that I was going to be able to teach at a community college. And there were so many young adults out there in their 20s, a lot of returning vets who were coming back to school. Our own Fritz Archer was one of them. And um, it was very exciting. They were just hungry to learn, and I really enjoyed that population. We still have that population today, but I think we're drawing more from the area high schools than we used to in the early days. I think the idea of a community college uh, was uh, a bit foreign to them, and now it's caught on and it's very common. And I know when I went to Blackhawk, I, I wondered about how it would be, and 
I remember them telling me, you'll be ready for Augustana when we get through with you, and that was really and true. That's, that's the way it was. Yes, and uh, so I feel that maybe uh, we still get a lot of non-traditional students, but there was just that really that thrust of students who had been waiting for this opportunity mm -hmm. and uh, my dad was one of them so it was really nice to see those people who for often economic reasons or sometimes family reasons didn't have the chance to go to college <coughs> right after uh, right after high school but we still have that very casual relationship with our students and I think that really is a good transition from high school that they can come to mm -hmm. uh, to uh, a smaller college and many times when they write their themes they talk about that relationship and as one of the strong advantages of coming to Carl Sandburg College. Well, I agree with uh, what Kathy has said. I think uh, in this is this is my second time around teaching. I think uh, although we obviously still have a lot of uh, you know what we refer to as uh, non-traditional students. I, it seemed that we had more of them in those days and uh, one of the uh, all students present an exciting you know, are, are exciting but uh, what's really exciting is to see those people who you know for whatever reason couldn't go to college after they uh, left high school come back and, um, and, and, and use this as an opportunity to begin their college education uh, it's, you really get uh, warm fuzzy feelings when you mm -hmm. see those people succeed their dream finally blossomed on September 24th of 1966 when the residents of Knox and Warren County said yes in a public referendum. In November of 1966, the first board of directors were elected. Three were from the Monmouth area, one from Abington, one from Aquan, and two from Galesburg. Elected to the first board of trustees was John Lewis of Abington, Russ Lynn and Dr. Carl Eisman Jr. of Gelsberg, Dr. Ben Shaver and Max Stoltz of Monmouth, A. Lewis Long of Near Monmouth, and Paul Platt of Rural McQuan. The first major task for the board was to hire a president. His name was Eldis Henson, former high school basketball coach from Kentucky who successfully had started two junior colleges in Southern Illinois. He was hired at a starting salary of $20,000 to formulate the new district. Eldis held from Mount Vernon, Illinois. He was 53 years old and had served as president of Mount Vernon Community College for the previous six years. He was also the superintendent of the Mount Vernon Township High School District at the time. He had 32 years of teaching, 24 as a principal, superintendent, or college president, plus five years in college public relations, and seven years as a college president. He was an honor graduate of Murray State University in Kentucky and had a master's degree in education from the same university. His undergraduate studies were in social studies and English and his major in school administration. I think Eldis Henson was hired in like the first of June, and they started classes in September, and he was the first president, and he hired uh, Dr. <coughs> Masters and Dr. Kelly, Dr. Kelly for an instruction, and Dr. Masters for vocational, and they started classes in September. So there wasn't that much time mm -hmm. to uh, get things off the ground. But uh, I remember also Carl was um, uh, very excited when they selected uh, Aldous Henson as president. Uh, because he felt that he was kind, he had kind of a folksy charm at that time, um, that was before he became ill, and uh, would have great appeal to the, uh, the rural community. And uh, also he was apparently good at getting a community college up and off the ground, getting it started, that, that was what he was good at. Eldis Henson had a lot to do with that. Yes. He was uh, a down-to-earth, gentleman from Kentucky, uh, kind of laid back but uh, practical. I think Eldis Henson uh, carried these smaller rural districts fairly well and, and I think sometimes in the history of the college uh, maybe an, not enough credit is given to his own personal interest coming down here and, and doing a lot of this. 
people at Sandburg, Elvis Henson, didn't promise the moon to Hancock County. They didn't say, we're going to come in here and set up an entirely new campus or anything like that. And in the committee, we went to uh, Elvis Henson and the others at Sandburg, and they said, we will promise you that we will serve you the best we can, but we're not going to say these things to get you to come in. And actually, that, I think that impressed most of the local people, that here was a very frank talking person who uh, really did want us in. And you're right, his um, contribution was significant. What character did the college's first president bring to the table? At a board meeting after being on board for only one year, Ellis Hansen refused an offer from the board to raise his salary. However, that same night, the board agreed to give Bob Green, the business manager, a whopping $12,000 salary, and the president's secretary, Mary Lou Allen, was given a raise to $7,400 yearly. A young man named Bill Hungate was hired as a consular and basketball coach for $12,000, and a fellow named Daryl Clevidence was hired as a faculty member at a starting salary of $8,900. Next came a contest to name the infant school. The final four possible names included the Lincoln Douglas Junior College, Heritage Junior College, Prairie State Junior College, and of course, Carl Sandburg Junior College. Other highlights of the early years, the first classes were held on September 18th of 1967 with 44 students enrolled. Classes were held in five temporary locations, Central Congregational Church, Brown's Business College, the Corpus Christi Gymnasium, and even Knox College in Gelsberg High School. In July of 67, it was announced the college would help with a nursing curriculum. Knox Warren Junior College took over the tone phase of nurses training programs from Cottage Hospital School of Nursing. Then in August of 1967, the new junior college absorbed Brown's Business College. The college board entered into a contract with Brown's Business College, which provided instructions in the business and commercial fields. Uh, but Bob Green owned the business college, and he became the business manager of, the, of, of, the, of, of Sandburg. And he was business manager when I started. And there were, um, so then we, we have we had faculty that came here from Brown's Business College. Uh, Bill Burkhart, uh, Judy Skinner, yeah, and Jody Resonito, and uh, um, I think one or two other ones maybe mm -hmm. came from there. And so we took over. They took over the Brown's Business College. Didn't we also? Uh, didn't the college Sandberg also? Um, buy or take over a school of cosmetology at one time? That came a little bit later. Um, I would say that was probably in 1974 or 75. Was it? Mm -hmm. And that was a uh, young school of beauty. Mm -hmm. And the college brought that up. And of course the college also took over the, uh, R or the RN nursing program from the hospital. From, from Cottage Hospital, and they shut the, that down. The first foundation was formed in March of 1971 to raise scholarships for needy students. The college's first commencement was held at Central Congregational Church on June 16th of 1969. Dr. James Holderman, newly named executive director of the Illinois Community College Board, gave the address to about 100 graduates and 250 guests. The first graduate of Carl Sandburg College was Greg Becker, who received an associate in the art degree. Galesburg Police Chief John Slough received a certificate of police science degree during the first graduation. Commencement speakers included Governor Jim Edgar, Helga Sandberg, and several college presidents. Of course, Burl Ives, the famous movie star, was one of the speakers at Carl Sandberg's commencement. Pretty funny story about Burl Ives, even though he had starred in several top-notch movies. 
He was very nervous about addressing the graduation class at Carl Sandburg College. About four minutes into his speech, he said, that's it, grabbed a stool, his banjo, and started entertaining the students, probably the most popular speaker of all time. Following graduation, Sandburg students were applauded for helping to build a levee at Aquaca to hold back floodwaters. What goes around seems to come around. If we go back in the history, when the college, when the community college law went into effect, any area that had at least, I think, a population base of 80,000 people could, could form a community college. It was not necessary to encompass the whole, the whole state. At, uh, and that's how we got started in the geograph. And this was a fairly small uh, area, counting Gelsberg, Monmouth, and so forth. Uh, we had, they had the 80,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, the state passed a law that there, there a regulation that you had to be in a ge go into a community college area if you did not have one, or form a new one, or specifically vote to not be in a community college area. And at that time, uh, Eldis Henson decided that we needed to enlarge the area substantially and uh, promoted the area west to the Mississippi River clear down to Warsaw and Hamilton and in that area and it was decided that I mean by the, their uh, voting that they would come into the district. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not go into Macomb because that was Spoon River's area but the area south of Macomb industry uh, voted to come into Sandburg area rather than the Spoon, Spoon River uh, co college area. And so we became 3,000 square miles. At when when Eldis Henson um, helped formulate this district, he must have known every, um, col or every uh, school superintendent and principal and, and uh, community leader in western Illinois to be able to sit down and convince people to join Sandburg mm -hmm. uh, that were in Warsaw instead That's of going right. with John Wood or Spoon River. You had to really have been an impressive person to, to <coughs> and, and also one that everybody trusted. Yeah. And, uh, and we thought, we, we need to, we're working to get back to that time. But I've, I've, I've thought about uh, that a lot uh, over the years. In the early 70s, uh, I lived in Carthage. Uh, prior to that, I lived in Macomb, and I came to Macomb in 1971 as well, Bill. Uh, at the time I came to uh, Carthage, we were not in a community college district. In those days, we referred to them as junior colleges. Mm -hmm. But uh, Hancock County, uh, a good portion of McDonough County and Adams County were not in any districts. One of our concerns out here in Carthage was if we associate with uh, Galesburg or with Quincy or with uh, Canton, are we just going to be the tail of the dog and not really have uh, much interest? But uh, the people in Galesburg were very interested I think not just in having us as part of the district, but in participating and doing things to serve us very well. Not that the others would weren't, but we saw uh, we saw something from the people at uh, Carl Sandburg that we liked very much. It was a very positive experience. And then we see this building here today and the uh, other courses that have been provided here. I think I think the community's been well served. Right. We had looked at that area before, and I was in administration at that time. I moved into administration mm -hmm. and. Uh, 1978, and I think Jack came, what, in 81, 82, something like that. Mm -hmm. And we had looked at that, and but had not come up with anything firm. And uh, when he came, he decided that we ought to have a a uh, regular building down there, and proceeded with that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I had uh, I had never heard of uh, Galesburg or Carl Sandburg College. I was uh, serving in the U.S. Army in Vietnam, so I applied from Vietnam, and um, I left Vietnam the first week of August 1971. I came here uh, without going home to Cleveland to interview for the job, and uh, Dr. Kelly, the Dean of Instruction at that time, uh, said, don't call us, we'll call you, so I 
went back home to Cleveland, never expecting to hear. And they did call me, and uh, I put my stuff in the car, which was all I had. Didn't take much to move in those days. Came out here and started teaching the first week in September. And uh, that must have been extremely difficult uh, for the students because I had spent two out of the last three years uh, in Vietnam. And here I was the first week of September uh, teaching. And I, you know, just left Vietnam that uh, the first week in August. And uh, some of the some of the offices were in the main Butler building, but uh, the office that I was in was in a trailer. The whole social science division was in a trailer, and I think the humanities division uh, had a trailer next to that. And then the president's <laughs> office was in a trailer next to that. I came in '73, and I certainly remember Fred Beisel. He was. A, a young man with a lot of energy, and all the students uh, really liked his classes because he was so energetic. And in fact, he was legendary for some of his uh, classroom antics. Uh, many times I've gone by Fred's classroom and seen him up on the desk, uh, pointing at the board to make sure his point was was well taken by the students. And uh, I think Fred's right. We most of the uh, teachers that were hired were fairly young, and so for many of us, this was our first. Uh, job out of graduate school. It was certainly mine. In fact, I had accepted a job as in the personnel office at one of the factories here that I really wanted to teach. And out of desperation, I too had sent in my application and had not heard. So I went in on a Friday afternoon and uh, talked to Bill Kelly. And he said, well, you look kind of familiar. And I said, well, I'm from here. And on his desk was my application with my picture attached. And I guess that's why I look familiar. But anyway, he did hire me part-time that year and then full-time the next year. If you look at the dedication of people, you have to look at our board and mm -hmm. see how dedicated they are mm -hmm. of the hours that they spend, not just at board meetings, but other meetings and uh, mm -hmm. go, going to to retreats or going to mm -hmm. state meetings and so forth and recognizing that nobody on the board is paid. They were uh, uh, good and dedicated people working uh, to the betterment of uh, Carl Samberg College, uh, not just in Galesburg, but, but uh, th there was a genuine uh, feeling that they were obligated to serve the entire district, uh, which, is, which is a feeling that uh, carries through to today. Um, we went back and forth a little bit. Uh, my math teacher was Mary Schomberger. Uh, I had graduated from school. They needed a new director. Uh, they asked uh, for local input. I went out and discussed uh, possibly uh, appointment of Mary Schomberger as the new director. As it turned out, she was selected. And, and then shortly after that, a year or so, I, uh, a board member of the, of the Sandberg board, Jerry Nutt from Carthage, uh, actually resigned from the Sandburg board so that he could be mayor at Carthage and uh, they needed a, a board member from from the Carthage area or needed a, an appointment and the, as everyone else has brought out this morning uh, there was always a, a feeling that representation should ex extend throughout the district so basically they came to look for a board member from Carthage well then Mary Schomberger uh, had recommended that that uh, I be uh, interviewed and, and asked about it and and um, uh, apparently they were uh, uh, happy with what they saw and of course I felt uh, a deep obligation to Carl Sandburg College for what uh, it had done for me uh, and I was appointed to the board in uh, May of 1981. I've seen this college go through a lot of technological changes and to a, some degree I think uh, we were a pioneer in that. I remember that uh, when I was Dean of LA, the Learning Resources uh, Center that uh, our Learning Resources Center was one of the first schools in Illinois, uh, one of the first libraries to get a fax machine. And uh, in those days, we would have people coming in on tour to look at the fax machine <laughs> and look at this wonder. And today, uh, I mean, everybody's got a fax machine. People have got fax machines in their cars. But uh, in those days, uh, when I first started in the library in 84, fax machines were right on the cutting edge. So. Well, you know, when I came here, we did uh, what they used to call the macrame classes and yeah. uh, just just little things to let the communities know 
that you had a presence in their community. But now everything's technology. The training for industry all fall under that area now. We still do the PE classes and the, the macrame and that kind of stuff, but not so much. It's technology and we have senior citizens, which is another big thing now. And senior citizens are into technology too. They, they like those classes. So many of the administrators uh, have come up through the ranks, either here or in similar institutions. And I think that is uh, a, a very big strength for us, that, that um, it, makes sense, it made sense to them at the time. And uh, um, they just they had an empathy that, that if they hadn't been in the ranks, might not have had right. before. And it's uh, I, both Kathy and I have, uh, well, in, in fact, Dr. Christ have had the opportunity to be on uh, both sides of the fence, uh, faculty and administration. It's not really a fence. I guess it's uh, we've had this chance to be on both sides of the room because we're all in it together, and that's uh, one thing that uh, that the kind of governance structure we have. Uh, is one of the things that makes it so great is that uh, you always feel like you're participating and it's never something that, you know, it's not things that are being done to you. You always have a chance to express your opinion. Uh, that's, uh, that's certainly true. Mm -hmm. The divisions were formed in 1969 uh, and prior to that there had not been divisions because it was all handled by, by Dr. Kelly and Dr. Masters. And uh, there was the uh, humanities division, social science, and business division, and math and science. Uh, other than that, everything else, as far as vocational-wise, came under uh, Dr. Masters' uh, office and under his jurisdiction. jurisdiction. And even when there are uh, issues to deal with, um, because of that structure and also because of the the close-knitted uh, relationship we have, we can address it very quickly, and, and uh, that's been a big help, too, I think, being able to say, this is an issue, let's deal with it, and um, I don't feel that hierarchy nearly as much as I've seen it in some other places that I, that, uh, I visited. But I know we spent days um, hammering this out and developing this rather huge document having to do with the governance structure. And it was kind of interesting because be, because of the influence, I think, of Knox and that so many of the faculty here were spouses or husbands at that time of people at Knox or Monmouth, uh, we tended to follow a governance structure which was rather common in um, liberal arts colleges mm -hmm. rather than in community colleges, which I think is a good thing <laughs> that, that we did that. <clears throat> but if I were to give anyone uh, the leading role, uh, I would say Ruth Torrance probably had the leading role in that. The bulk of the uh, document stands as, as mm -hmm. was written, mm -hmm. and it, it is, um, uh, I think, uh, one of the reasons why we're, uh, we're um, able to, um, to, to garner the input of people and to have the role models uh, that we do have uh, uh, in all uh, ages of our faculty and staff. And one of the things that I... Uh, had early on in my career were a lot of good role models. Ruth Torrance was one of those that you mentioned earlier, and Jen Yaw, and, and I think we continue to have that here. And I've always thought because of the uh, governance structure um, that we have, that's why uh, we continue to have people that stay here for a long period of time and retire here. I can remember going with Dr. Masters down to Carthage and taking a look at some buildings downtown mm -hmm. which did not seem to be to fit our need and of course that the original campus was built and by an investment group and we rented it from them rather than to uh, own it. I think now you own it as I recall. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, own it and it's right. been expanded um, and about to be expanded again right. I think. Good. Well some of the um, uh, community leaders that were, the, were champions for the college uh, made this happen early on without, uh, I think there were 10 of them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that worked with the board um, to fill this facility and gave us a, a lease lease uh, arrangement on it and ultimately then we bought it uh, from them. But without their support, 
early on that might not, we might not be here today. And lo and behold, Carl Sandburg College opened up an attendance center uh, in the second floor of the student center at Robert Morris College. Um, it, it reminds me of a story of a, of a lady in, in Bushnell who uh, had never gotten her GED, never gotten a high school diploma. And uh, she had raised six children and all six children had gone to college and graduated and were successful, but uh, she'd always found excuses that there was something that uh, uh, would keep her from continuing her education and getting her high school diploma. And then one day, Carl Sandburg College went and built a school just two blocks from her back door. And so she ran out of excuses and, and subsequently ended up getting her GED. And it was um, actually the proudest moment of her life. Uh, my, my wife was friends of her husband's from, from where she works. And uh, their Christmas card seven months later included graduation photos of her at her GED ceremony. And one of, one of the uh, 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 accomplishments that the college has done that, that uh, is, their, is their association with Southeastern Community College in Iowa, in uh, Keokuk in uh, Burlington, Iowa, uh, which was, which was uh, put together and designed so that those people from the southern end of the Warsaw School District, more than 100 miles away from Galesburg and certainly 40 miles or so away from Carthage even, uh, could attend uh, community college at their in-district tuition rate uh, and receive uh, quality course offerings. Uh, that has been a good deal uh, for the students. It's been a good deal for Carl Sandburg College. And I'm, I'm certain it's also been a good deal for Southeastern College. So um, I, I guess the thing that I've been most impressed with is uh, Carl Sandburg College is our community college. Its um, responsibility is not to Galesburg or Bushnell or Burlington or Carthage, but its responsibility is to the entire district. Uh, if you look at the history of the college in each um, instance, um, from Eltis Henson to Bill Anderson to Jack Fuller and to Don Christ, uh, this uh, part of our district has continued to grow and, and, and grow and grow. And, and that probably would not have happened had it not been for the leadership and the guidance of the board. So to have a board that is very supportive of an entire district uh, certainly has impact, uh, an impact on, on the leadership of the college uh, during, during that uh, time. So, uh, and, and speaking of that, could you think a little bit about some of the things that have happened that uh, maybe were milestones in the evolution of this part of our district? Um, you mentioned the Southeastern uh, Agreement. That was one of the first things that happened. Really a significant factor right. for our local community college or junior college exploration right. committee, whatever it was called at that time. A couple of things as aside. Uh, John, your father was a big supporter of our committee back in those days, and uh, uh, we had some discussions with him. He was a uh, influential leader here in the community and held political office here in the community and supported it. Uh, you mentioned Jerry Nutt. Uh, he was also active. Uh, Stu Tracy, uh, Tom Phelps, who I mentioned earlier, was, uh, was put in hours and hours of time. Uh, Mr. Uh, Heggie, Dale Heggie, let Tom have that time to work on this because he saw it as something that's very important. And I know that uh, those people, some are no longer living, but they would be gratified to hear that what they hoped has come true, that this area has been uh, well served. It, it, it was a little hard at, at times to understand when the money had gone into the Galesburg campus and we finally had an opportunity to do something down here. But uh, John, I guess we were able to work around that. And, we did. Uh, and, uh, we For the were better. Able, and, and we were able to get the facility, and I guess the bottom line is the important thing. And, and, and I'm not, I'm sure the people that uh, raised questions about that had sincere motives, but, uh, but I still have a little trouble understanding with the development of the campus, which is beautiful in Galesburg. Finally, we had a chance to divert some of those sources down here <laughs> into this area. But I think the presence of this uh, attractive building uh, was, uh, was a major milestone. And I guess, uh, you know, you have to credit, I think, both the administration, primarily the administration, because a board sits there and the administration brings you recommendations and then you react to them and, and, and your job is not to get into the administration of the college. We boards have problems with that at times. We as individuals have problems. But I think uh, uh, when we uh, face some adversity about that, uh, 
we kept thinking, we kept planning, and we got the job done. And credit <coughs> to the administration of the college for bringing it. I think credit for the board for being willing to 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 move into some different directions. Uh, but the bottom line was we have an attractive facility here, which has given us an attractive presence in this area. Uh, since that time, we've added the Bushnell facility, but I think certainly this building, the center in Bushnell, uh, as I turn on the radio now, I'm hearing exciting things going on over there, uh, and uh, I think that was a milestone. Bill Anderson was the president, and, and they were trying, uh, Bill was trying to make us all understand what this district was about, because we didn't know, we didn't have a clue. So he rented a bus, uh, a big bus and uh, put us all on this bus and we stopped at your house and had uh, lunch on the way and that was the first time I met you and, and, and uh, found out where the Cuba Corners uh, is. <laughs> and I uh, thought, uh, thought I was a long way from Galesburg, Illinois and was only halfway to, <laughs> to, to Carthage. And, um, and, and that was probably one of the best things that uh, could have happened because that bus was full uh, of all of us that uh, began to understand what uh, what needed to be done here, and I think that uh, grabbed the hold of me in, in a big way. What I tell people is is that Carl Sandburg doesn't provide education; it provides people with opportunities to succeed. Uh, and this is what they did for me. They they I was able to see that that uh, by taking classes at Carl Sandburg College, I could be successful, uh, and, and that I was a a valuable person to to myself and my community, and. Uh, it, it was just a, a wonderful thing that Carl Sandburg College did for me. One of the things that we've, I, I've really enjoyed um, the last several years getting to know um, Penny Niven and Helga Sandberg. Mm -hmm. Bill Anderson started that okay. relationship. Uh, and when he started that relationship with the Sandberg family, um, I recall at one time and, and one and only time mm -hmm. that all three sisters we're here at the same That's time, right. and I think Helga, or Margaret, I can't recall which, gave the commencement address. Helga did. Helga did. Helga, Helga did. But Margaret was here, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. um, and all three sisters. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Helga's the only one that's, that's still living. That's um, but uh, uh, Bill started that, uh, started that uh, relationship between the, mm -hmm. the Sandberg family mm -hmm. and the college. And it has uh, it has grown. Jack mm -hmm. continued that. In fact, I mm -hmm. think uh, at least on one occasion, Jack and Corky Fuller went to um, um, Cleveland mm -hmm. to see Helga right. and Barney Kryle was still living right. at the time. Um, but I think the community uh, has prospered because of the the relationship with the Sandberg family, mm -hmm. and the college certainly uh, has benefited uh, from its namesake. In the beginning. Um, this college probably would not have um, come about had it not been for the support of Knox College. Mm -hmm. And that uh, from the get-go, Knox College, the Knox College community supported Carl Sandburg mm -hmm. College. I think a lot of folks don't understand that or haven't thought much about it, uh, but mm -hmm. that was critical in those early days. Right. And, and that always we've had someone on our board uh, from Knox. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Eisman was on, uh, Gary Francois was yes. on, uh, so we've had people and, from and, the... Uh, and Wayne. And Wayne Green, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, th I think that's, that's yeah. true. There's been a good cooperation between Knox mm -hmm. uh, and, and Sandburg. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that any time you, if you look and say you're starting up a college, mm -hmm. Whether it's a community college, four-year college, or what, you need to you need to have the cooperation and, and the mm -hmm. approval, you might say, of the existing colleges that that right. you're coming on board. Let's ponder together a few thoughts from our namesake, Carl Sandberg. Sandberg said, "Go as far as you can see, and when you get there, you'll see even further. If you can't win each." future challenge, make the person ahead of you break the record. Time is the most valuable coin in your life. You and you alone will determine how that coin will be spent. Please be careful that you don't let other people spend it for you. And finally, a good thing to remember and a better thing to do. 
please try to be part of the construction gang and not the wrecking crew. And with these thoughts in mind, I give you the charge to carry on the dream.